Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar in the Reaching for the Stars campaign. My name is Noah Redler. I'm a board member for the Canadian Friends of Tel Aviv University uh, chapter working on the, and the executive director of this campaign. Uh, today, we're going to talk about something which uh, I'm pretty passionate about because, because since a young age, I've been interested in space, in science fiction, the idea of exploring space. And as I got older and learned more about it and become more, became more involved in the innovation community, I've actually had the privilege of working uh, with several space agencies on thinking about how to expand the knowledge of what space agencies and the private sector have traditionally worked together on to think about what the future of space travel for humans will be. And as we go beyond as satellites and we think about living on the moon for long periods of time, and then maybe jumping forward to Mars or other planets and beyond, we have to think about how we're gonna live there together. We have to think about how we're gonna survive on other planets. And a big part of that question is how we're gonna breathe and how we're gonna eat. And so as we go further into our discussion about into new space and the opportunities available through, uh, through the new era of space exploration and collaboration, uh, we have an exciting discussion uh, for you. We have deciding, an exciting discussion for you all today where we're literally going to discover how or, uh, uh, companies here on Earth are trying to solve the question of how humans are going to live on other planets or satellites because the moon isn't technically a planet. So uh, be, uh, to introduce our speakers for today, as always, we have with us one of the stars of our campaign, Professor Colin Price, Head of Environmental Studies, uh, Studies Department at the Porter School of Environmental and Earth Sciences at Tel Aviv University. How are you doing today, Colin? Good, good to be with you again. Always a pleasure. Uh, could you uh, give us a quick uh, uh, intro of yourself or those who are joining us for the first time? Sure, so my name is Colin Price. Um, I'm a professor at Tel Aviv University in the geophysics department and uh, presently also heading the environmental studies department. Uh, we also have uh, two relatively new centers at the university, which I'm involved in. One is a nanosatellite uh, center, which we launched our first CubeSat, uh, TauSat-1, earlier this year, January of this year, which is actually studying uh, the space environment, fairly harsh environment around the satellite and the energetic particles which bang into the, into the satellites and interfere with electronics. Um, and at the same time this year, we opened up a new climate change uh, center at the university that I'm leading to look for solutions for climate change. And satellites and climate change, they can both uh, work together and we can use space actually to monitor the climate and to maybe better our environment by looking at things like agriculture and pollution in the oceans and the atmosphere. Um, I suppose that's it for the moment. <laughs> well, that's, that's quite a lot already. <laughs> and just a reminder for everybody uh, that uh, uh, that Professor Price and his colleagues are responsible for developing the nano satellite that will be launched into space for climate observation and uh, for climate change observation and research. Uh, and before uh, Colin, uh, Professor Price will, as always, be uh, leading us in a panel discussion a little bit later. But before we get into that, we have two guests who are going to present a little bit more about how they're talk, uh, preparing us for life on other planets, uh, for life on the moon and eventually probably and eventually other planets. Uh, before we get into their presentations, I'd like to introduce them one by one and just uh, get a little background from each. Uh, 
Uh, starting off with Jonathan Geifman, founder and CEO of the Helios Project. How are you doing, Jonathan? Great, thank you. How are you? I'm doing good, thanks. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the Helios Project? Yeah, sure. So as you said, I'm a co-founder and the CEO of the project. Uh, myself, I uh, studied uh, aerospace engineering. Uh, Helios is a project, uh, an Israeli company, uh, in which we are uh, developing technologies to produce oxygen on the lunar surface. And I will elaborate about that much more. Uh, Just out of curiosity, how long have you been working on this project? Uh, nearly four years. Okay, so uh, I've been working on it for a while and getting ready for the, I guess, really near future on the moon. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. And also with us today, we have Pascal Rosenfeld, Director of New Ventures in Space at Aleph Farms. How are you doing, Pascal? Great. Thank you. And you're joining us from France today, uh, if I understand. I am. I am. A truly international uh, uh, webinar uh, today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Aleph Farms? Okay, so the, the, the good point today is that I, I am a, a former student at Tel Aviv University, so it's, a, it's an extra pleasure to be here today. Uh, it was a great time there. Um, so I'm, I'm in charge of new ventures in space for uh, Aleph Farms, and what we do at Aleph Farms is that we, we're taking just stem cells and we grow them to full stakes instead of slaughtering animals for the same results in a, in, in a way. And there are plenty of other applications, especially for space, that will uh, develop today. Um, that's about it. We'll, we'll share more. So we're not actually going to be a blasting off account to space anytime soon. We, you've got some other ideas for us. Perfect. Well, we're looking forward to hearing about it. Uh, but without further ado, let's get directly into the presentations. I'm going to pass it off uh, to Jonathan uh, from the Helios Project to uh, share his... Uh, to, are, you, are you all good to share, uh, Jonathan? Yes. Perfect. Second, please. So yeah. Jonathan will have about a 10-minute presentation for you, and uh, it's all yours, Jonathan. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so Helios, as I said, I'm uh, the CEO of uh, Helios, an Israeli company. Uh, our vision as a company is uh, to develop technologies that will enable sustainable human life on Earth and beyond. And while doing it, uh, pushing for uh, STEM education, as well as we see it part of the long-term sustainability of human life uh, to keep the, the next generation part of it. About the company itself, in briefly, uh, as I said, uh, we're an Israeli-based company. We exist nearly four years. Uh, we're backed by the Israeli Space Agency, Israeli Ministry of Energy, Israeli Innovation Authority. Um, we're sitting in Tsuriga, which is about 30 minutes drive from Tel Aviv. By the way, our Tel Aviv University connection is on the uh, second from the right, on the right picture, Professor Brian Rosan. Uh, leading the uh, material energy uh, um, lab in uh, in the university, uh, so uh, so the university also has some stakes in the company as well. <laughs> um, we do have three missions to the lunar surface that we are on board with. Uh, you can see here our signing uh, ceremonies. We had uh, we. Japanese company iSpace for two missions, first one by the end of 2023, second one mid-2024. And on the right picture with German aerospace company OHB, in which we are on board their first mission that is due to the end of 2024, maybe beginning of 2025. The purpose of these missions, and I'll get to that in a few slides, uh, a bit more, uh, is to demonstrate the technology of producing oxygen out of the lunar soil, okay? So just to lay the ground for why even doing such a thing as uh, trying to produce oxygen on the moon, uh, humanity is going back to the moon. Uh, this is seems to be quite obvious uh, lately because uh, for those who are uh, uh, interested in the topic, because uh, the first lunar base is already under construction. Uh, the first two modules of that base are going to be launched to the moon by 2024. Uh, in the next five years, there are going to be more missions uh, sent to the moon than there were missions since the Apollo era. So we, you know, we humans, 
we have like a linear way of thinking. It's very hard for us to grasp exponential phenomena. And uh, we see this as an exponential phenomena. And we honestly think that uh, in the coming decade, things are going to dramatically change and advance uh, on the lunar surface as well. And one of the key challenges in this amazing endeavor in general uh, is going to be the extraordinary cost of sending anything from Earth to the moon. To, to date, estimated at over $1 million per kilogram. And the most sought after consumable by far is going to be oxygen. And by the way, not only to breathe, actually breathing is quite a small portion of that uh, demand. It's mainly uh, for rocket propellant. And just to give you a sense of how much oxygen is going to be needed, on the right, you can see a model of uh, Starship, SpaceX's flagship uh, vehicle that is currently under developed, development. And this was also chosen by NASA as the main workhorse for these missions in the coming years. And this vehicle, when fully loaded with cargo, propellant, and everything, is expected to weigh 1,400 tons. Out of that weight, nearly 1,000 tons is just oxygen which is more than 65%. And this ratio is pretty much true to any other space vehicle uh, that will revolve these missions. And it will need to get refueled in orbit on the moon at the later stage also on Mars. And there is no way around it. We must be able to source this oxygen on site in order to sustain this whole thing, this whole project uh, in the long term. Our solution is to take this oxygen from the soil Sand soil, we give it, I mean, the, the general name for it is regolith, which is a broader term for soil, sand, loose gravel, etc. Uh, and it is usually comprised of more than 40% oxygen by mass. The reason for this is because it's just a mix of minerals and oxides uh, that has oxygen that is chemically connected to silicon, aluminum, iron, titanium, etc. And by the way, this ratio is true. The 40% oxygen is true anywhere on the moon. It's true on Earth. It's true on Mars. And it's, I think, it's true well, most likely on any other uh, planetary body in the solar system that has uh, solid ground uh, with rocks and, uh, and sand. We're going to extract it with electrolysis. Uh, melting the lunar soil and electrolyzing it, just like electrolyzing water when you split the oxygen and hydrogen, same concept, we're splitting the oxygen and uh, the other metals like silicon, aluminum, iron, titanium, etc. Out of one ton of soil, we're going to get roughly a quarter ton of oxygen, quarter ton of iron and silicon, and half a ton of slag, which can be used as concrete. Uh, our roadmap to the map is to conduct a small scale experiment by the end of next year on the ISS, on the International Space Station. Five missions on the moon before 2025. Currently we're on board three missions, negotiating two more these days. Hopefully we'll have it uh, ready in a few months. And hopefully by the end of the decade to be able to uh, get this to full scale. Derived from the research we're doing to produce oxygen on the moon, we came up with a new method to produce iron and steel, not for the moon, but here on Earth. Uh, because when, do, when producing oxygen as a byproduct, we get, among other materials, we get iron. And using this method here on Earth to produce iron instead of how it is produced today, and as a byproduct, getting oxygen you know, carbon dioxide, can be a very interesting concept and this is something we investigated in recent uh, months and it is very interesting because the steel industry is one of the most pollutive industries in the world responsible for nearly 10 percent of the world carbon emissions and there are no viable solutions to date to solve this i mean there are several options that uh, many companies work on around the world but they're not seem to be even close to be commercially competitive our approach is totally different. It's novel. It's not something that was tried before. Um, and it seems that it can dramatically reduce the cost of, uh, of establishing a steel production plant. It uh, will reduce carbon emissions to zero because we're going to emit only oxygen. Uh, but depends on where we get the energy because we will need to heat. So if we're going to uh, be connected to the grid, and it depends how this electricity is produced, of course. 
but in the process itself, which in the traditional way of pr producing iron is the most polluting part, emitting nearly two tons of iron of uh, carbon dioxide per ton of steel, uh, which annually the world produces something like two and a half billion tons of steel. So you just can imagine how much uh, uh, carbon emission this produces. Um, in our case, we only emit oxygen. Um, and that's it. I mean, I'd be happy to answer questions to the follow up discussion, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. We're going to have a question period for everybody at uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the webinar after the discussion. Excuse me, but uh, just one uh, one question uh, quickly before we uh, before we uh, hear from Pascal. In how many years do you see having uh, your having a facility on the moon producing oxygen for humans? In how many years will that happen commercially? Uh, well, for, uh, not, not, not necessarily commercially, but just even like, uh, when do you expect to have your first oxygen production facility on the moon operating to provide oxygen for humans? Okay, so most likely the best case scenario will be roughly in 10 years, uh, because it not only depends on our and uh, maturing this technology, but also on the rest of the value chain. We will need a lot of energy, we will need excavation tools, we will need uh, uh, technologies to store these materials we we'll need customers etc uh, in order for this you know to all for all of this value chain to to become uh, realized um, so if the stars will align and everything will work perfectly uh, it will happen roughly by the end of the decade it might sound um, like like science fiction maybe but as I said in the beginning of my presentation uh, it seems that things are moving exponentially think that in two years from now it will seem more obvious that this is might actually happen by the end of the decade um, absolutely and i think that's a very fair timeline uh, considering where things are going but just like uh, but one thing i also find really interesting in what you've done is that you developed a technology in space but found benefits for us here on earth and part of what we want to pr uh, promote uh, with the reaching for the stars campaign is that while we invest in space maybe it seems like we're investing in otherworldly things but there are benefits we can gain for producing iron, for example, or data for climate change. And that's one of the messages that we want to put forward. So thank you a lot for that. Yeah. Great. Uh, if I could ask you to just uh, stop sharing your screen, please. Yes, sorry. Oh, no, all good. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, now uh, I'm going to invite Pascal Rosenfeld uh, to join uh, to share his uh, presentation and tell us a little bit more about Aleph Farms. Sure. All yours. Can you see my screen? Yes, indeed. Works? Perfect. So I'll start with a short introduction about the company. It's an Israeli company, of course, based in Rehovot. Uh, we are currently uh, close to 70. Uh, I'm one of the only few outside of uh, Israel. And what we do uh, for a living, uh, we cultivate high quality meat cuts directly from the cells. Uh, that we isolate from the healthy animals without killing the animal nor polluting the environment or polluting less, let's say, mass massively less. Our mission is to build resilient and sustainable food systems for tomorrow, meaning that it would be on Earth or uh, on Mars or on the Moon. And the purpose is to deliver the tastiest and healthiest meat experience to, to anyone and anywhere, wh whether you're here or on another uh, planet. Uh, I'll just um, put this into perspective. I'd like to illustrate this with our key milestones so that you understand uh, where we stand. So we, we started the company, the inception was like five years ago, approximately, and the, uh, the uh, foundation, uh, the incorporation was uh, a bit more than four years ago. Um, Aleph was the first company to cultivate um, real beef steaks from stem cells meaning not just the fiber, but the full uh, structured steak. Uh, I'll come, uh, I'll give more details later. Then uh, we were the first company to cultivate meat in space, like uh, mammalian cells on the ISS with our uh, partner 3D bioprinting solutions from Moscow. And uh, I'll, I'll just uh, give more illustrations on the, on the next missions. And uh, lately, nine months ago, uh, we were the first to 3D bioprint a whole muscle realized steak with a, a Technion, with a Levenberg uh, uh, lab. 
So uh, to, to understand what, why we, what is the connection with space, simply that space faring, like a, a journey from here to Mars requires fresh and nutritious food. And it is limited by, uh, as uh, Jonathan said, by, by weight, by the, the mass you can send and, and the, the, the freshness of your food because of food decay in time. So uh, we need food production systems uh, that are bioregenerative and that can locally feed the communities with quality nutrition. Um, uh, back to the origin of the, of the company. Uh, so it's, it's very important to underline that uh, it's stemming from uh, medical research and that medical IP has been uh, transferred to uh, the, the, the food industry in order to produce meat for, for everyone and potentially other uh, application in the future. Um, so um, the the, ex, the expertise of Aleph co-founder, uh, whom you see on the, on the left side of the picture, Professor Shulamit Levenberg, who uh, issues to regenerate or repair injured muscles like heart muscles or spinal cords. And the, the thing is that this ability was transferred to other farms to produce meat. So the, the ancient technology and years of research allows us to produce the uh, many different types of cells. You know, we have, uh, um, let's say that uh, mammalians have around 200 different types of cells. And we, uh, we just select uh, pretty much the, the ones that are in a real steak. Uh, and, uh, and the result is a fresh beef whole cut steak that incorporates all the natural properties of, of the delicious meat that you, you, you can think of uh, at the restaurants, meaning the vitamins, the amino acids, the fatty acids, and uh, all the micro and macronutrients. So uh, just in a few words, how does this work? very quickly so that you understand the, the link with space and how it could be a, a, a tra transformative. Um, so um, in fact, we, as, you, as you can see, we, we mimic nature as much as possible because it's the, uh, it's the best source of uh, inspiration. And instead of growing the, the meat from an animal, which takes two to three years approximately, uh, and a massive amount of natural resources. What we do is that we grow the animal outside of the, of the uh, 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 we, we grow the meat outside of the animal, in fact. So we grow specific cells, like I said earlier, so muscle, fat, like uh, adipocytes, vascular system, and um, elements that produce the collagen, which is the, the glue of the, the whole system. And um, instead of three years, this process takes three weeks and a tiny, tiny fraction of the usual resources uh, needed. So in, in fact, we, we just provide the, uh, the, the right environment, the right uh, temperature, the right nutrients, nutrients in order uh, to, to create this, um, this piece of uh, meal. Um, I'm going back to the, uh, the data and the, the figures uh, provided by Jonathan, and I think we, we can agree on, on that. So we, we are limited by, by food storage capacity and, uh, and food decay in time, but more specifically, uh, prices. The prices are just like astronomical. And uh, the second thing is that if you're on Mars or even, yeah, let's say on Mars, you cannot wait six months for resupply. So <clears throat> in order, we, we need, you know, food, uh, the, the food that is provided to astronauts is not necessarily uh, what you would expect in a good restaurant. And in order to, to make it shelf stable for space travel, it is highly processed and it loses a lot, a lot of its characteristics and taste. And the acceptability by the crew just drops in, they tend to eat less. So you know that uh, astronauts lose mass, they lose uh, bone mass and, and so on. So one of the elements to bring, let's say, a happiness to our uh, explorers. Uh, I think meat is a, is a good, um, is, is a good uh, parameter. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of prices, what, what we think is that it's definitely going to cost uh, at least half a million dollars per kilo to, to bring anything to 
the moon at the beginning, uh, currently, uh, according to the prices I got, it was $150,000 a kilo uh, on SpaceX, uh, according to the, the, the uh, contract they, they signed with NASA, but it doesn't even take, it doesn't even take into account all the forensics in R&D. So uh, from that, uh, our, our vision is, is very simple or simplistic is that we believe we can be a game changer for space exploration and the space agencies, whether NASA or European space agencies or, or other, we, we talked to them and they, they understood that Aleph's platform is already at the lab scale. It, that means it, we can already now produce meat for astronauts at the lab scale for, for a small crew. And as over 90% of our inputs, as you see uh, on the image, is water, 90% is water, uh, we, we believe that we can source it either for Jonathan or, or other companies that will, will just provide us uh, uh, water uh, in situ. And in addition, on, on our downstreams, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can recirculate 98% of our downstream water. So it's very much close to a close closed loop system, especially if we if we plug to other hydroponic systems uh, that are already um, in uh, in development. So la last, uh, just an example, this is the uh, experiment that started this uh, space story for other farms. It's uh, it was two years ago, and we, we used the uh, one of the two bioprinters that exist uh, that uh, that are in place on the ISS. And uh, you know it's very difficult to produce uh, any kind of organ or even meat if we consider uh, the microgravity environment. So uh, this is a very special uh, technology that they have. And uh, our next next experiment is with uh, Rakia, with the um, with the Ra uh, Ilan Ramon Foundation in, on the twenty first of January, uh, February. Sorry, we are living with SpaceX and uh, and Space Pharma and uh, the Ramon Foundation to. Uh, to try and grow um, uh, our mammalian meats, I mean beef cells, uh, in in space on the ISS. Great. Thank you very much, Pascal, for the presentation. So uh, I think we can all like uh, understand the applications of that. Just the longer we spend in space, if we're going to live on other planets, we want a well-balanced diet and of more choice than maybe we would have available to us. Uh, and so my question is: uh, So you're talking about the uh, you're talking about steaks, but what about other animal uh, animals like uh, pork? Of it, well, no, not pork. Sorry, uh, chicken, uh, chicken uh, or lamb or other animals. Uh, like, is are you thinking about going into those uh, in to those uh, meats as well? So uh, the specificity of Aleph Farms is currently focusing on mammalian. So it means that we work on beef, lamb, pork. And I mean, for the moment, it's, it's most of what we're, we're consuming. Uh, why, why we, uh, we, I mean, we, we focused on beef mostly because it's the most polluting industry on the planet. Uh, I mean, close to uh, cement and the transportation, it's, it's about 14% of greenhouse gas emissions, especially because uh, cattle uses approximately 50% 50, 50 of our index, agricultural index. So it's in, in terms of uh, already, I mean, for, for me, I'm dreaming of a, of a world where we, we just, uh, we just uh, reform it and re reformulate the way we, we're using the fields and the, um, and the, uh, the agricultural land. So it, it, we, we have to we have to imagine a, a world where 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 a lot a lot of possibilities in terms of reforestation of or repurposing of land, if we if we succeed to do so. But uh, in terms of uh, variety, for the moment, we definitely focus on 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 on, on beef and mammalian cells, and uh, and most specifically because we have extremely good experts in terms of of uh, savor and organoleptics and everything delicious with thinking in terms of breeds also because breeds are very important uh, uh, to to convey uh, what uh, Oregon earth what we need and what in space we are dreaming of so this is
Right. So maybe a buffet in space one day. Perfect. So we're going to have a chance to learn a little bit more about both your organizations during our discussion. Thank you both for your presentations. And I'm going to pass it off to Colin Price uh, to uh, have to uh, begin the conversation. Cheers. Off to you, Colin. Great. Thank you, Noah. And thanks a lot to Pascal and, and Jonathan for those uh, really fascinating uh, insights into their companies. Um, I'm going to so I'm going to ask each of you some questions. Also, some uh, that I thought of during your talk. So I'll maybe start with Jonathan. That you need a lot of energy to do this on the moon, uh, also on Earth. And so, what would your source of energy be on the moon to produce the oxygen? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would even say that uh, usually when we're discussing this, it's the elephant in the room uh, because we'll require a lot of energy uh, in order to be able to, let's say, refuel a starship. Okay, that will require something like 900 tons or 1,000 tons of oxygen. Uh, because with our process, uh, we need something. If you want to be able to refuel a starship, let's say once a month, we will require something like uh, five megawatts. Okay, just for that uh, just for that pace of production. So when we set ourselves this benchmark of what is a commercially uh, what's a commercial scale for oxygen production on the moon. And as I just said, we decided that would be uh, being able to refill a starship every lunar cycle, you know, every month, more, uh, more or less. So uh, in order to do this, uh, we need several megawatts. And this brought us to, uh, to realize that uh, relying on solar energy uh, is most likely not going to be realistic in the short term. Uh, Maybe at a later stage, when we'll be able to, uh, we'll have a well-established infrastructure and astronaut on the ground, and we can uh, maintain and and uh, uh, several football fields of uh, solar farms. Uh, then okay, but uh, at this stage, uh, in this coming decade, we don't think it's reasonable, and uh, therefore we think that the only viable solution for this is going to be fission. Uh, reactors. There are several companies around the world uh, that are developing what's called micromodular fission reactors. Uh, usually their bread and butter business is to sell these small reactors to uh, like uh, uh, isolated places uh, in Alaska or places like this. Um, but they do have these projects. We are, for instance, in contact with a company like this in, uh, in the US. Uh, we are writing a white paper with them these days. Um, and it seems that it's pretty much aligned with our timeline in regard to when they'll be ready uh, to provide this amount of energy. And uh, it, it actually, it all adds up pretty nice because uh, we are going to show that uh, under inside one Starship's payload capacity, which is roughly 110 tons, we can uh, fill it up with the required equipment to be able to refuel a Starship every month for five years. So even if not getting into the numbers, it makes sense. Uh, and this is our plan currently. Uh, hopefully in two years from now, we're going to do a nice uh, big scale experiment uh, that we're connecting at this stage virtually our reactor with the fission reactor uh, across the Atlantic uh to showcase that this is something that uh, is viable okay great and to pascal a similar question um how easy or difficult will it be to make these uh to make these uh, stakes on on the moon or another planet you mentioned resources mainly water you would need but uh, i suppose on earth we have everything available to do it in the lab um so um, what's the, 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 the key problem or the, the stumbling block to do this in space? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I really like the, the way Jonathan put it. It's, it's what um, Peter Diamandis from SpaceX, uh, from uh, XPRIZE is, is, is um, explaining it, is that we have this linear vision while everything is exponential in this, uh, in, in this industry. And when Jonathan says that, this and that companies are just progressing and will be providers of energy or, 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 or supply supplies um, 
everything is imbricating and everything is accelerating at some moment. So if you just look at it now as, uh, as just uh, pieces of Lego, you, you just will, will just imagine that we are dreamers. Yes, we, we are dreamers, but the, the, the amino acids of the, the puzzles are already there. And I, I'm sure that uh, many of us will succeed and this will accelerate. So for us in terms of uh, it's not energy intensive, of course, what we have in mind is just to produce the, uh, to bring uh, the growth medium and to, uh, and the bioreactors, obviously, but uh, the, what, what we need is definitely water and water there's, uh, there is, so it, it definitely you need to harvest it because you, you don't have a tap on the moon or Mars, but uh, water is, uh, is going to expedite our, our progress if we, if we find it. A cheap enough water, then the uh, the uh, the results would be uh, reached much faster. By the way, does the do these uh, uh, cultured steaks which you make in the, the laboratory do they taste like regular steaks? Some people say that the the type of the meat, the flavor of the meat, depends on what the cows are eating, the type of grass and where they're growing, and the climate. So now, when you're in the laboratory, what do they taste like? Uh, that, that's very interesting. I mean, I hope you, you'll be able to, to taste it soon. Um, we, we are increasing the scale uh, at the Rehovot facility and we are being, uh, building the first, uh, we're in the process of being the, building the first large scale. Um, so hopefully uh, very soon. Uh, normally, uh, mid-large scale production will be in less than two years from now. And I've tasted it several times. And uh, we have uh, phenomenal people, really experts in, uh, in meat. I mean, we have one of the best experts on the planet on, on meat. We, we're serving the uh, presidents and kings of the world. And um, I, I actually, it, it's in terms of mouthfeel, juiciness, everything is there. Uh, in terms of taste after any way you, you, you can cook it uh, the, the way you feel it. And as I said earlier, you can add uh, vitamins or uh, uh, amino acids, I mean, the elements, the micronutrients that, that you want. So the, the advantage of the meat as I feel it is that it's, it's juicier, so more tenderness, which is what people are looking for. So if you really want to understand steaks, it's that for, for the past, uh, decades uh, people have been going to ground meat so they, they, it's just uh, just industrial meat that we're eating and it accelerated in the last five years so out of 650 kilos of a cow approximately 250 kilos are, are is meat and the rest is mostly discarded or hides for, for for leather which is like a very small portion if you imagine the beast and out of these 250 kilos left, only 40 kilos will, will be a uh, whole steak. The rest is ground meat. So we, we are really uh, focusing on a niche market of people who, who like uh, exceptional meat and meat in general. So we have the juiciness that we were looking for uh, even, even better, I think. It's very tasty. Good to hear. Back to Jonathan. Um... Why do you, why should we not maybe directly invest in this technology here on Earth to benefit sustainability, which is maybe more important in the short term than going to space to do it? Yeah, that's that's a great point, and and uh, also I'd say uh, lately in recent months there's also some criticism uh, about the space industry in general in regard to space tourism and billionaires that uh, fly themselves to, to space when there's so many problems here on Earth. Uh, so why spend so much money and uh, not doing this directly? Um, but the main reason is that this is not how uh, new developments happen and new technology is uh, born. Uh, usually uh, it comes from... Um, uh, let's say, let's call it true incentives, whether it's economical, economic, or during war or stuff like that. Uh, and unfortunately, and this is maybe me being pessimistic, I, I personally can't see any true incentive to decarbonize the industries here on earth. Mm -hmm. There are uh, 
tax programs uh, to uh, carbon tax and stuff like that out of political pressure. But eventually these are trillions of dollars of industries uh, that invested each of these companies tens or hundreds of billions along the years uh, in CapEx. And now decarbonizing, there is no real incentive to do so. And um, when you're on the moon, when you're doing uh, oxygen on the moon or metal or whatever, uh, you don't have the luxury to emit carbon emissions. Not because you care about global warming on the moon, but because as I said, it's a million dollars per kilogram. Meaning if we emit a kilogram worth of carbon in carbon emissions uh, on the moon, it means we just wasted a million dollars. So one of the, the drivers to do something on the moon that is uh, commercially viable uh, is to make it as uh, have less, at least that waste as possible, not emitting anything. Uh, and it's, it's crucial. And in this specific industry that unfortunately is not existing yet, uh, hopefully in a decade it will, the cislunar industry, but when it will, uh, I'm sure that you'll see many, many more technologies that will come out of it, that then we can use it and implement it here on earth, uh, technologies that will help us to decarbonize these industries, these materials like uh, Scott mentioned cement, which is one of the most productive industries in the world as well. Uh, iron and steel. I mean, uh, these, these are like the big chunks of the pie chart of carbon emissions. And um, so, yeah, the, this is how I see it. Okay. And I think that uh, the, the, the technologies to, to decarbonize uh, the industries on earth will come from space, It's my opinion. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah. Uh, back to back to Pascal. Also looking at the Earth now, less for space. Um, uh, your technology can obviously have uh, major impacts on food security here on Earth and sustainability. Uh, but how easy do you think it will be to scale up your your initial laboratory results to on a global scale? If to feed the, the seven billion people on Earth, not all of them eat meat, and not all of them will want to eat meat. But uh, to really have an impact on food security and sustainability, you have to have very large scale factories which can produce this meat. So how do you go about that? You're a mute. I'm mute. So there we go. To, to, to better understand how our space technologies can benefit the Earth, uh, I, I can share that with you if you want to share with your students. Uh, this was published by uh, Hightworks. It's a UK magazine. And you, you know that NASA is producing like thousands of, uh, of patents and IP every, every year. And most of it is, uh, is available for, for startups to, to thrive. And some of them are even for free. So space definitely benefits uh, the Earth a lot in so many ways. And uh, I, I want just to, to, to focus on, on this benefiting the Earth is that, you know, we, we think of space as, uh, as, um, as an extreme environment to better our systems for Earth. Uh, in fact, in space, you, you don't have a choice. You, you need to be frugal like nature. Nature is frugal, it's magical, and nothing goes to waste. And uh, space exploration will need to be frugal and all these discoveries in space will benefit Earth at some point. For us, the purpose is really to miniaturize all our systems and, uh, and space is just, um, uh, it's, it's the revelator. It just shows us where, where, where we built the system the wrong way. And uh, you know, I love Sir David Attenborough and he, he puts it actually like this. He says, anyone who thinks that you can have Infinite growth in a, in a finite system is either a madman or an economist. And this is where we, we, are, we are pushing our planet. We, we have been uh, developing our processes uh, for the past centuries inefficiently and devouring incredible amounts of natural resources. And when you're in the moon or on the ISS, you just can't do that, simply not do that. So uh, towards your, your question regarding um, uh, development, in fact, we, we signed 
uh, we sign a partnership with regional uh, producers like uh, Cargill in the US, BRF in, uh, in uh, Brazil, uh, Migro for Europe, uh, Mitsubishi in Japan, and Thai Union for, for Asia in general. And we, we will develop, we will co-develop this, uh, this um, large, uh, large entities that we call uh, biofarms uh, to produce uh, cultivated meat for, for everyone, or at least everyone who wants to eat it. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure there will be uh, plenty, especially we, we have uh, all the, the panels that we've been checking in Asia, uh, they, there's, uh, they, they're ready, they're very, uh, very prone to novelty. And they understood that it's pretty much uh, evident mm -hmm. as a choice. Great. Okay. And so a last question for Jonathan about your future missions. You mentioned something about some of the future missions, but maybe you can elaborate on some of the upcoming missions to the moon and maybe other locations. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so our, I mean, our goal in the near future in the coming three to four years is to uh, conduct several uh, experiments, uh, not on earth, uh, one, the first one is going to be on the ISS on the International Space Station by the end of next year. The purpose of that mission will be to measure the uh, effects of reduced gravity on the evolution of oxygen in our system because it is going to, to affect it. Um, obviously, on the station you have uh, uh, zero gravity, so we're going to use a centrifuge in order to simulate gravity and we can uh, play with gravity as a variable and uh, and uh, have some uh, deep insight on that, uh, on these uh, effects. Uh, later on, we're going to have, as I said, five missions to the moon. The purpose of having five missions and of roughly the same size payload, which is going to be uh, give or take 10 kilograms, two shoe, two shoe boxes, something like that. Uh, these uh, payloads were going uh, to have uh, nearly 60% of the payload is going to be a battery uh, to heat up, to uh, use the induction model to heat up uh, the reactor, uh, the lunar soil, melt it, and then uh, run the electrolysis and uh, produce oxygen and do the measurements. Now, here on Earth, we can simulate many of the different aspects of the moon, whether it's the soil itself, uh, vacuum, temperature gradients, uh, radiation, etc. But the one thing we cannot simulate for long is the lunar gravity. And there is no way around it. We must run these experiments on the moon um, because these are kind of stuff that were never tried in this kind of environment. And, uh, you know, eventually there are too many unknown unknowns and we don't know uh, how this, I mean, we can simulate, we can do all simulations we want, but eventually we have to do it there on the ground and uh, measure measure how it works. And actually the, the main purpose, uh, the main goal of the first lunar mission is like literally what was uh, dictated to the engineers. The main goal of the first lunar mission is to be able to tell why it didn't work. <laughs> Okay, or if it worked, why it worked not that good? Uh, because we're sure that, uh, as I said, there are unknown unknowns. Uh, and it's critical for us to understand uh, what these uh, are going to be and uh, how our process, which worked perfectly here on Earth, why it doesn't work there or we work poorly. Uh, and from there, uh, our approach is to iterate. And hopefully by the fifth mission, we're going to have a perfectly optimized process. Uh, and from there, we'll feel, we'll feel more comfortable to source the required funding in order to scale this up on the moon, because this is going to cost a lot of, uh, a lot of money, of course. Yeah, I think, as I say, in Israel, with a lot of the startup companies, that failure is just one step to success. Exactly. You need to fail along the way. You can't <laughs> succeed the first time. Uh, okay, and the last question to Pascal is also for your future. You talk, I've heard about the, the NASA C, uh, CSA Deep Space Food Challenge that you were awarded a prize there, your selection. Can you tell us a bit about this? Yeah, so uh, this is NASA and the Canadian Space Agency. So it's, uh, it's an additional uh, pleasure today <laughs> that we can share. 
Um, so we've been selected on the, on the NASA side, uh, American companies. And uh, for me, it's, it's definitely going to be an Apollo moment for the industry, because as I said earlier, they understand that we, we can already build large scale uh, systems that can provide food for, for teams, for, for explorers, for crews. And um, so for, for the, the production uh, bio, bio uh, microgravity on, on the moon and on Mars won't be a problem if we build such bioreactors. So there's a lower uh, uh, gravity, but it, it's, it's just fair. Uh, and uh, the, the NASA uh, designed this uh, centennial challenge around resilience. So resilience, because resilience has been the term for the past two or three years when people think about food security everywhere. It's a major problem. Food insecurity is very much everywhere and we're gonna feel it with inflation again. So the selected teams need to feed a crew of four people for three years with no resupply. So in addition, there are limitations in terms of footprint, in terms of energy and natural resources uh, consumption like, 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 like water. So it's extremely challenging, meaning for three years, we have no resupply, so it's, it's for real. So we go to, to Mars or to the moon and you, you can't wait for the next cow going in six months from now. Uh, so this is why we, we, we like it. And um, the, the idea is definitely to work again on, on uh, let's say, moonizing our system and, uh, and building a sustainable system, more resilient, uh, with less waste, uh, with longer shelf life. And, um, and um, the, um, the, the, the first step of this, uh, I mean, the second step of phase two will be to uh, develop a demo, uh, a kitchen demo for uh, I think you, Pascal froze for a second. I have to wait for him to. Pascal? No, it's not coming back. Okay, well, uh, anyway, we're nearly out of time. So um, I'd like to pass the mic back to uh, Sharon Frankel to wrap things up, Executive D Director of the Canadian Friends of Tel Aviv University. So Sharon. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Price. I'm uh, sorry, uh, when, I don't know when you lost me, but I'm back, <laughs> sorry. No, just, at the, just at the end, but that's fine. We, okay. we need to wrap up, so um, I passed the mic to Sharon, but thank you both for that really fascinating discussion. Pascal and Jonathan, thanks a lot for being with us this evening, and Sharon can close the evening. Sharon. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank all three of you, of course, uh, um, Colin, uh, Jonathan, and Pascal, thank you very much for this informative insight into your companies and how sustainability in space could potentially lead to sustainability on Earth and uh, what uh, future life on the moon or on other planets uh, uh, could look like. So good afternoon. My name is Sharon Frankel. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Friends of Tel Aviv University for Ottawa, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, welcome and introduce our new national president, Mrs. Ariella Kotler. Welcome and thank you all very much for uh, having been with us today. Um, it was back in 2017 when uh, Professor Price was in Montreal, um, when we got inspired to work on the idea known today as the Ilan Ramon Memorial Project or the Reaching for the Stars campaign. And at the time, Professor Price shared the vision of a future nanosatellite nano center with us at the university and showed us a prototype. And here we are today, four years later, and as you just heard, um, we have a nanosatellite center and we have the first nanosatellite uh, in space. And so here we are planning and uh, launching a campaign um, to develop the next one. And uh, our reaching uh, for the STARS campaign, which we launched on uh, June the 20th on uh, Ilan Ramon's uh, birthday, Alava Shalom. Uh, we are now determined to raise the funds to build a nanosatellite dedicated to environment and climate change issues, but not only for the, to identify the issues, but hopefully to find solutions with the new 
the Climate Solution um, Center at the university. And if you're interested in finding out more about the special project or would like to get involved, um, please contact us. Contact us by phone, contact us by email, uh, by our, uh, our website, and we're going to post all the information in the chat uh, below now. And I invite you to keep your ears and eyes open for some great announcements coming very soon, as well as um, a couple of other webinars that we're planning um, for potentially December and early 2022. So I would like to uh, also thank our wonderful campaign executive group led by Noah Redler, our chair. Um, we have a lot of exciting events coming up over the next 12 months. And in the meantime, all I can do is thank you for your participation today. And we look forward to seeing you very soon again. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening in Israel. Toda rabai, everyone. And looking forward to the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.